Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this uh, webinar this afternoon where we're launching uh, our latest report um, from our partnership with the uh, Department of Children, uh, Equality, uh, Disability, Integration and Youth. Um, and this report is titled Fathers and Children from Infancy uh, to Middle Childhood. Uh, and the report is available on the ESRI website and it was published uh, jointly by the ESRI and the department uh, this morning. So uh, my name is Anne Nolan um, and I'm an associate research professor uh, in the social research division here at the ESRI um, and I'm going to be chairing uh, this morning or this afternoon's uh, webinar. So uh, with me today um, we have the report's authors, uh, my colleagues uh, Professor Ingrid Smith and Professor Helen Russell uh, and you'll be hearing from Emer in a few moments who's going to talk you through uh, the main findings from the report. Um, we also welcome uh, Kira Pigeon um, from the Parenting Support Unit in the department, who's going to provide a policy response uh, to uh, the report uh, after Emer has spoken. Uh, and of course, we're really delighted uh, to welcome uh, Minister O'Gorman here this afternoon. Uh, so I'll hand over to him in a few minutes um, for his opening remarks. But before I do so, uh, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background, I suppose, on the partnership uh, and on the report that we're launching today. Uh, so the report being launched today uh, is the fourth report um, published as part um, of the research partnership between the SRI uh, and the department. Um, and we'd really like to acknowledge the role of the department in supporting this research and the partnership uh, more generally. Uh, so the, I suppose the objective of the partnership is to draw on the rich uh, data that's available in growing up in Ireland to, I suppose, provide evidence uh, for the development of policies in relation to children, young people, and their families. Um, so there's been a number of reports uh, that have been published to date. So there's been a report uh, last summer on the COVID-19 pandemic and the implications for policy in relation to children and young people. A second report then on risk and protective factors for adolescent behavior. And then a third more recent report on the dynamics of child poverty. Uh, and there's a few more reports uh, forthcoming as well on second generation migrants and disruptive transitions due to the COVID pandemic. So today's report, uh, I think you'll agree, is a really uh, uh, interesting uh, topic. I think fathers have tended to be neglected uh, in research uh, on families uh, to date. And I think what you'll, you'll really join me, I think, in finding what's going to be discussed today really interesting. It provides, I suppose, lots of new evidence uh, on previously, I suppose, underexplored topics, uh, and particularly timely, I think, in relation to, to you know, new policy initiatives in relation to parenting supports. And for example, things in relation to parental leave. So uh, I think Kira will probably give us more details on that later. Uh, so finally, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the work of the, the wider Growing Up in Ireland team. Uh, they work behind the scenes all the time uh, uh, in making sure that these data are available for all of us as researchers. And I'd really like to sincerely thank them. Um, I'd also like to thank the Central Statistics Office, who, uh, alongside the department, work to manage the study uh, and also provide access to the data. And then finally, not, um, last but not least, um, our GUI participants um, uh, and their families who uh, give so generously of their time and have done so repeatedly over many numbers of years. Uh, so we're really uh, incredibly grateful to them. Uh, just a few practicalities before I hand over to the Minister. Um, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, so please do submit your questions uh, there. I'll be keeping an eye on them throughout this webinar, uh, and we have plenty of time at the end uh, for discussion. Um, so now uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome Minister O'Gorman uh, to this webinar. Um, uh, we've really appreciated your support over the last uh, number of report launches, um, and today is no different. So. Uh, Without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Minister, to, to launch the report. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks, thanks, Anne, for your your, your very kind uh, welcome. And I'd also like to just take this opportunity to thank Emer and to thank Helen for asking me to launch this, the most recent report from my department and the SRI's research partnership uh, entitled Fathers and Children from Infancy to Middle Childhood. And as I'm sure many of you are well aware at this stage, the, the purpose of the research partnership between the SRI and my department is to generate policy relevant research analysis and outputs that are specifically focused at uh, supporting public policy developments, particularly in the area of children and youth. 
And this report is the fourth report to be produced from this partnership. And I think uh, it, it has it, it's more evidence that this particular partnership is really meeting the, the remit and the, the idea that, that it was it was based on. And today's report, like the others before it, it, it draws really on, on a wealth of data from other another successful partnership that's been up and running for a period of time between my department and ESRI, that being the Growing Up in Ireland, that longitudinal study of children, which uh, which Anne has has mentioned already already, and the data is the richest source of, of, of data on children and their families in Ireland. And as we know, it's used by hundreds of researchers to explore a, a very diverse range of, of of issues and themes. And I'm really pleased to see uh, that it's been used to provide insights into uh, the influences of fathers on child experience and outcomes, which, as today's report actually points out to us, hasn't been very well studied, uh, particular when considering uh, the, the degree to which the influence on mothers on children has been studied. So I was looking at this report over the weekend and, you know, it, it gave me a lot of things to think about, particularly in terms of uh, uh, existing and, and, and on, ongoing uh, policy development. And Helen and Ema are going to give us a flavor of some of the important findings of the report. But I just thought we might take the opportunity now to reflect on three of the findings that, I, that, that, that particularly struck me. And the first is that the report shows the importance of fathers spending time with their young infants, and that this investment in time tends to have a lasting effect and result in greater engagement in, in middle childhood. The time when an infant is very young is precious, uh, and as any experienced parent will say um, it, it, to, to perhaps a, a new parent, it, it's really important to take that time to enjoy that, that particular period. And this period in a father's life, especially for new fathers, obviously can also be very uh, stressful, and it's beneficial for fathers to take time out of work to adjust their new role. And these findings provide strong evidence that the government must continue to support fathers spending time with their young infants. In 2008, when the children referred to in this report were born, fathers at that stage were entitled to 14 weeks of unpaid parental leave, um, but they weren't entitled to any paid paternity leave or any paid parents leave. Obviously, as we know, uh, that's no longer the case. And the take up of uh, paternity leave and benefit has increased significantly since it was first introduced in 2016. So in that year, 5,013 fathers took it up. But up to uh, September of this year, 2021, 24,726 fathers have availed, have availed of it. So uh, a very, very significant take up of, uh, of um, um, paternity leave in, uh, in, in this year. Earlier this year, of course, I introduced the Family Leave and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 2021, and that extends the entitlement to paid parents' leave for each parent of a qualifying ch child from two weeks to five weeks, uh, and with this leave to be taken within the first two years of the child's birth or adoptive placement. And a really important facet of parents' leave is to encourage the sharing of responsibilities uh, for taking care of a young child. And I hope that this additional period of leave will support and again encourage fathers in taking a more prominent role in the care of their young children. And we were very clear when we introduced this leave that it was not non-transferable. It was for the uh, it, it, it was for uh, the the father. And that non-transferable nature of parents' leave and benefit also increases the proportion of fathers who will over time avail of this entitlement. And in budget 2022. We included funding to enable the further extension of parents' leave from five weeks per parent to seven weeks per parent from July 2022. And I hope in conjunction with uh, the Department of Social Protection and the Department of Public uh, Expenditure and Reform to be able to further increase this to nine weeks of paid leave per parent by the summer of 2024 to meet our obligations under the uh, under the relevant EU directive. And I agree with the report that further research would be useful in unpacking the complex relationship between the provision of leave and the 
decision to actually avail of that leave. And my department is considering the policy framework to encourage family leave uh, uptake and will monitor how and when parents uh, uh, pa parents avail of their leave entitlement. Though we did see this year a very significant uh, increase in the uptake of parents' leave, uh, and that's certainly something that I'd, I, I, I'd welcome. The 2021 Act also removed the presumption of gender from the entitlement to adoptive leave, which leaves it up to individual families to decide which parents avails of adoptive leave, depending on their own particular situation. And that, that change also supports LGBTI plus families uh, where, 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 the, uh, where, where it's a, a male same-sex couple to benefit, uh, to, 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 to benefit from adoptive leave. I'd also just like to draw attention to the whole of government strategy first five, which is a 10 year plan from 2019 to 2028 to help make sure all children have positive early experiences and get a great start in life. And the first objective of that plan is to assist parents to balance working and caring to contribute to optimum child outcomes that best suit their own family circumstances. And it includes actions to facilitate mothers and fathers to care for their child at home during their first year and to enhance access to fam family friendly, flexible working. And one of the main missions of my department is to improve the outcomes for children. And this report shows that children who have a good relationship with their fathers are happier, they feel less anxious, and they're more engaged with physical activity. And the Irish Health Behaviour in School Age Children study also gives us some insight into the relationship between Irish children and their fathers. And the uh, indications from that study show that the, the relationship is improving. So for example, in 1998, 47% of all children reported finding it easy to talk to their fathers about things that really bother them, while in 2018 this had increased to 72%, so a very significant uh, increase there. The second key theme that I'd like to reflect on uh, are the insights in the report about fathering and gender norms. And gender, role, gender roles are the dominant and inherited way we think about men and women. And gender norms seem to matter. What you think a father's role should be affects how you parent. If you think that a father's main role was providing financially for the family, uh, unsurprisingly, you tended to work longer hours and be less involved with your children when they were small. And this resulted then in a less positive relationship with them when they were that bit older. And the report also cites some recent evidence internationally that pattern, patterns of combined working, work and care during the pandemic resulted in, in more rather than less gender division of labor at home. And in this context, it'll be interesting, you'd be interested to note that my department is currently engaged in work which will result in a statistical spotlight on gender norms that collates evidence of masculinities in the Irish context. And the purpose of this work is to promote an evidence-based approach to policymaking in the area of gender equality. And this work will also be of interest and help to fathers and expecting fathers to reflect on their involvement in their children's care. And while providing fathers with more time to spend with their children is really important, it's not enough on its own. And we need to ensure that the supports available in our communities and workplaces are welcoming to and meet the needs of fathers. Parenting and family support services are there for everyone with a parenting role. And traditionally, they've often been aimed, you know, almost exclusively at mothers. But providing parenting support that is genuinely inclusive requires more than just welcoming fathers into the existing forms of support. We need to continue to recognize more about the parenting supports uh, uh, support needs of father uh, father uh, of fathers recognizing them recognizing that fathers themselves are a diverse group and many parents have a very uh, diff uh, different experience from their own parents and this is uh, particularly true uh, particularly true from for fathers and I know Kira will, will be talking more about that 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 wider role of parenting and particularly particularly the work that, that our uh, department are, are ongoing in terms of providing greater uh, parenting supports. And finally, I, I was very encouraged to read, read that four-fifths of nine-year-olds describe themselves as getting on very well with their fathers, and most indicate that they would go, uh, that they would go to them for help with any problem. And I was also heartened to read that the majority of children and uh, got on well with their non-resident father, especially if they spent a good uh, amount of time with their father uh, and where their mother and 
uh, their got along. And this highlights the need to support parents through relationship breakdown and ensure where possible that both parents are involved with their children's lives. So as uh, to, to, to sum up, I suppose, the, the report has really broadened our knowledge and our understanding of the influence of fathers on child experiences and on their outcomes. And it clearly identifies key policy questions arising in relation to family support practices, employment practices, and parental and paternity leave. And this, as I said at the beginning, is a subject which has not had the benefit of a significant research attention before and as such I'm really happy that the research partnership between my department and ESRI, ESRI has supported this insightful and thought-provoking report which I'm absolutely sure will have a very significant impact on uh, policy making into the future. So once again thanks to Helen and Emer for this really important uh, piece of uh, policy work. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Um, that was really um, uh, reflective, I think, uh, that piece um, and sort of picking out the, the main findings, um, but also giving us, I think, that sort of broader policy context is, uh, has been really useful for us. And I suppose it's, you know, it's not just about parental leave and the period after, after birth, but that sort of wider environment around employment uh, and caregiving right through uh, children's lives. So, uh, Thank you so much for your time uh, this afternoon and um, I will now hand over to my colleague uh, Emer Smith who's going to give uh, the presentation of the main findings. Good afternoon everybody. Um, I'm going to present on behalf of um, myself and my colleague Helen Russell um, but both of us will respond to any questions that you have. Um, we'd like to start by thanking the Minister for his uh, very supportive uh, opening remarks and for his ongoing support for the research partnership that we have with the Department of Children. We'd like to thank members of that program steering group who gave us very useful insights and, and feedback on the report. And we'd like to echo Anne's comments and thanks to the Growing Up in Ireland study team and to the families who have contributed to this study for so long. So just to say a little about the background to the study, um, as has been talked about by the Minister and by Anne, there has been a lack of research on fathers in Ireland, but there's really rich information in the Growing Up in Ireland study that we can exploit. So we use the younger cohort, the so-called cohort 08, and we follow fathers and children from nine months to nine years. Now, we mainly focus on those who were in two parent families for all of the waves and where the father completed the secondary caregiver questionnaire. That means that we can look at how the relationship between fathers and children changes over time. So this gives us information on over 4000 pairs of fathers and children. Now, unfortunately, the numbers um, of lone parent, lone father households and same-sex households were in the sample were too small for analysis so we can't look at them here today. So the main questions we focused on were what activities do fathers engage with with their children from nine months to nine years and how does that vary by their characteristics? Secondly what's the quality of the relationship between fathers and children and here we mainly relied on fathers reports but at age nine we could also ask the children themselves. And what helps in terms of parental stress from infancy to middle childhood? And finally, is there a relationship between the nature of the father-child relationship and selected out child outcomes? In particular, their cognitive development, their levels of physical activity and their well-being. So I'm just gonna present a, a kind of overview of some of the results from this. Now, this shows you the extent to which fathers are involved in the care for and play with their nine month old baby as reported by the father. It shows that just a selection of those activities and the red uh, is where fathers report that they share those activities equally with mothers and the blue is where the mothers are reported to be more involved. So if you look at the bottom of, of the chart, you can see that fathers uh, describe themselves as sharing a number of activities equally, including playing with the child and uh, changing the child's nappy. When it comes to feeding the child, uh, around half of cases, the father said it was shared equally. In the other half, the, the mothers were seen as, do, as mainly doing this. 
And then there were some activities that were more commonly done uh, by the mothers. Uh, these were bathing the child, but in particular dressing the child in the, in the morning. Now we took all these different items, not just the one shown here, but some other items as well. And we grouped them to come up with a scale where higher values mean that fathers are more involved in care for their child and lower values mean they're less involved. So this allowed us to look at variation uh, between groups of fathers. So what we found is that nine months uh, old, uh, fathers uh, with lower levels of education and fathers who themselves weren't in paid employment were uh, more likely to be involved in the day-to-day -day care for the child. And we also see that father's involvement is responsive to mother's employment. Um, so that where mothers were in full-time employment, father's involvement was greater. And it also increased in, in kind of response to the greater workload of, of the child being a twin or a triplet. In contrast, we see less involvement in some groups of fathers, in particular, where fathers are working longer hours, more than 40 hours a week, and involvement tends to be reduced. It's also reduced where fathers have more traditional views on their role as a parent. Uh, fathers were asked a number of questions about the main focus of their role as a father. Most fathers, of course, em emphasize love and support, but a, a group of fathers also emphasize the role as provider. And we see that those uh, fathers who emphasize their financial provider role uh, tend to be less involved in day-to-day -day care. And fathers in larger families are, are less involved. Now that has to be nuanced carefully because they're less involved with this child in particular, but they may be doing quite a lot of childcare if you average it across all of the children in that family. And at this stage, we don't see any difference in father's involvement uh, by, you know, by child gender. Now we move on to kind of five and nine years of age. And here, the measures that we have of father's involvement focus more on play uh, and outings than they do on the personal care of, of the child. So it's worth bearing this in mind. Um, we can see that fathers are, are fairly frequently involved in a number of different activities, including reading to the child um, at least a couple of times a week, playing with the child with toys or games, and engaging in sports or physical activity with the child. And again, as when they were younger, we see variation between fathers, but we see different sorts of variation. By this stage, we see a gendered aspect. We see that fathers are more likely to spend time frequently with their sons uh, than with their daughters. And we see that uh, in contrast to the picture that we saw when, when the children were babies, that was fathers who have higher levels of education are more likely to, to kind of read to their children, play with them and um, to go on outings with them. Fathers of migrant origin are more involved than native Irish fathers. And here again, we see the role of employment and uh, access to family friendly work practices. So we see the fathers who had availed of such work practices like uh, having more flexible working hours or being allowed to work from home occasionally, they were more frequently involved in their children's lives. Um, but where mothers were working longer hours as well, fathers continued uh, to, to be more involved in their child's lives. And um, very much the tone was set in the early days for parental involvement. Um, fathers who are more involved when the child was a baby are more involved when it gets to five and nine years of, of age. And we also see that some groups uh, have less frequent involvement. Again, the fathers with more traditional views are less involved. And fathers who are working longer hours when the child was a baby are less involved. So that kind of very high intensity workload during the first year of the child's life has longer term implications for, for the father's involvement in, in, into middle childhood. Now to say something about the quality of the father-child relationship, um, we see from the father's perspective, we see they, they feel high levels of attachment. So lots of bonding with, with the baby. And then they feel close to the, the child as he or she gets older. And there are relatively low levels of conflict between the fathers and the children. Interestingly, fathers report being slightly closer to their daughters than their sons, despite them being more frequently involved in activities with their sons. 
And we see that closeness at five and nine years of age is enhanced by early involvement with an attachment to the baby. Again, this first year of, of the baby's life emerges as crucial. And we see that there's a bit more conflict between fathers and their children where fathers have more traditional views and where the parents or the and or the child have a chronic illness or disability. So that puts kind of extra stress and leads to conflict. When the child gets to nine, we can then ask them about their perspective. As the minister highlighted, you know, the picture is positive. We see that 78% of, of nine-year-olds get on very well with their fathers, and that's around the same as the level for mothers. Girls are more likely to, to report a positive uh, relationship with their fathers, um, and children whose fathers are more involved, and where the fathers report a close and non-conflictual relationship with the child, um, the children themselves are more positive. So there's there's some you know uh, similarity between the views of, of fathers and children. As with the fathers themselves, we see that children uh, are a little bit less positive about the relationship where their fathers have more traditional views of their role. Now, as, as I said at the beginning, uh, we did focus on uh, two parent families, but we did have some really interesting information uh, from the children of uh, in cases where fathers weren't living in the household. Uh, we have other information gathered from those fathers, but that hasn't been released for analysis yet. And it will be a, a kind of a treasure trove, uh, you know, in the future. So we see there's a small group of these children who didn't answer the question, perhaps because they had no relationship uh, any longer with their fathers. But of, of those who did, and the majority did, um, two thirds said they got on very well with their fathers. And this relationship was described as more positive if they'd frequent contact with the father, especially if they stayed overnight um, on a frequent basis. And interestingly, uh, the positive relationship between the father and the child was facilitated if there was a better relationship between the mother and the father. Now, it's also worth looking at, you know, the extent to which being a parent, being a father is a source of stress. Um, we asked both parents about the levels of, of stress related to parenting, and we see kind of low to moderate levels across the life course, and they're highest in infancy, as you might expect as parents adjust to their role. Some groups of fathers experience more stress than others. Um, we have quite an interesting and complex uh, pattern in terms of disadvantage, because on the one hand, we see that fathers with higher levels of education report greater stress around parenting. But we also see that at the other end of the spectrum, experiencing increasing financial strain results in stress for fathers around the parenting role. We also see the migrant fathers um, despite their high levels of involvement, or perhaps because of them, a, a report more uh, kind of a little bit more stress around parenting. Parenting stress also reflects uh, kind of the, the, the size and composition of the family. Not surprisingly, it's greater for firstborn children as parents are trying to adjust to a very new role. It's also greater when there's more kind of calls on their time if, if the child is one of a twin or triplet and if there's a large family. Illness on, among the mother and or the child also is a source of stress. And we also see again, greater stress if the father has more traditional views of his role as parent. But what's really interesting and, and a very positive finding is that being close to the child and being involved in activities with them plays a protective role in protecting um, those fathers from high levels of, of parenting stress, even when other factors, if you like, go against them. We also looked at, you know, the impact that the quality of the relationship with fathers had on child outcomes. And we, we looked at kind of three domains of children's lives. We looked at cognitive development as measured by their vocabulary scores. We looked at physical activities based on uh, how often children reported engaging in physical activity over the previous week. And we looked at, at aspects of the child self-image, including whether they were anxious or not, whether they were described themselves as happy and their, their behavioral adjustment. Now, there wasn't a direct relationship between these outcomes and the levels of father's involvement, but 
uh, there was an indirect one because relationship quality mattered a good deal. So children who got on very well with their fathers reported less anxiety, greater happiness and better behavior on average. They also were more likely to be involved in physical activity. On the other hand, uh, conflict between fathers and children was associated with poorer self-image among boys, uh, but no significant difference for girls. And where fathers had higher stress levels, we see poorer outcomes for children, in particular for their vocabulary scores and for their engagement in physical activity. So just to draw some conclusions, um, we've tried to show that this uh, growing up in Ireland gives new insights into the role of fathers in, in child development in Ireland and has very significant implications for policy as, as the minister has highlighted. Firstly, around policies to facilitate care responsibilities for those in employment, as the minister noted, um, the, the cohorts were born before the introduction of paid paternity leave. But we do see clear findings that uh, family friendly work arrangements facilitate greater paternal involvement, while longer hours operate as a barrier. The findings clearly show that involvement and attachment are formed early. So it's really important that the state and employers facilitate such involvement. And really, we need to look more closely at the, at the level of payments and the access to top up payments from uh, employers as a potential barrier to, to engaging with with take up of such leave though the picture has has improved uh, considerably as the minister noted finally uh, it is important to, to kind of tailor support and information for fathers um, there's a good deal of good information out there uh, from the department and from HSE around parenting, but perhaps there might be a place to specifically mention and name fathers um, to reassure them really about the importance of the role that they adopt and, and the, the consequences for their children's well-being and also for their own well-being. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Emer. That was that was great and a really uh, comprehensive tour through the main uh, findings of the report. Um, we've had a couple of comments already, but I'm going to hold them uh, until the end uh, of the session, and we'll have a proper discussion then. So people just bear with me, um, and please do uh, submit uh, any questions uh, for Emer, Helen, and Kira in the Q and A. Um, so uh, without further ado, and last but not least, uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Kira Pigeon from the Parenting Support Unit at the department. Uh, and Kira uh, is going to give us uh, an overview and sort of a policy response uh, to the findings from the report. So uh, over to you, uh, Kira. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, firstly, I'd like to echo what the minister said earlier and thank everyone who's been involved in this research, um, Emer Smith and Helen Russell in particular, but also a huge thanks to everyone involved in the Growing Up in Ireland study. Um, it's, not a, it's not a small undertaking to share this sort of information about your family life with researchers. Um, and I know as policymakers, we're very conscious of the importance of making the best use of this information and the findings that are generated. Um, very often when you're looking at a, at a policy area, you don't have a full or clear picture of the current situation. And it's not always possible to know exactly what the impact of a change might be. And, and this is particularly the case with social policy where you know, the policies and legislation that we have are just are just one of many influential factors in how people behave in their lives. Um, and I think, you know, it, there remains very strong messages about father's roles and their abilities and strengths as parents, uh, you know, in our surrounding us in the media. And some of these aren't very positive and perhaps they're not very accurate or fair either. Um, I also think, you know, as policymakers as well, it's important to recognise we all have our own personal experiences of family lives and our personal views can be strongly influenced by those experiences and the families that we see around us. So it's really important to have this comprehensive piece of research, which gives us a full picture of the lives of fathers in Ireland. And research like this can often challenge some assumptions we, we, we may not have realised we had, uh, which is always a good thing. Um, in relation to different policies and approaches, we often talk about, you know, what works. Um, but, you know, to be honest, there's rarely a right or wrong approach um, to social policies. We, we need to often have a much more in-depth analysis about the effectiveness of different policies and legislation. 
And the type of questions we need to ask, you know, are along the lines of, you know, is something having the desired impact? And that impact may, may be to encourage or support the trend that's already happening in society. Um, you know, is the policy having the desired impact for all children? Uh, and if it isn't, you know, does that matter? And do we need to, to, to make some changes? Um, and, and also, of course, you know, are there any un unintended consequences of, of policies that we didn't predict? Um, another very important policy consideration is the cost of any changes. So, you know, in relation to um, you know, fathers providing new family leave entitlements, it has an impact on employers. You know, we need to recognize that. Um, and availing of entitlements has a financial cost for families themselves at a time when, you know, the cost of rent, mortgages and childcare can all be really significant. And for fathers themselves who, who might be availing of these new entitlements to leave, there, there might be a risk in how they're perceived in their workplace um, and impact for their own careers. So given these costs that we know are there, it's really important to be clear on, on the benefits of leave entitlement and supporting fathers in their parenting role. And this research shows you know, that children who have a good relationship with their father are happier, feel less anxious, and are more engaged with physical activity. And, you know, these are not insignificant outcomes. These are, these, are, these are things that people are grappling with across many different policy areas. Um, so, and, and we know that what anxiety and mental health for children and the impact of per physical, you know, uh, physical health is so important. And there really is an onus on us to do whatever we can to promote and support good relationships between fathers and children um, with that link clearly there. Parents, mothers and fathers make up a very large proportion of the population. Um, so it's, it's not surprising that there are many different policy commitments there, uh, both in things like the program for government and as the minister mentioned earlier, the first five strategy for babies, young children and their families. Um, and it was kind of was reflecting on, on, on how we frame some of those policy commitments. Um, and there's a number of pieces in the program for government, uh, and they're all um, directly targeted at parents. We don't we don't differentiate between mothers and fathers. Uh, the first five strategy is a bit more detailed. So, so you know, there, there, there's more reference about uh, what we can do in particular to support fathers. So, um, you know, extending the paid leave for both fathers and mothers. Uh, and enabling, um, you know, providing good supports for children to be cared for at home by fathers and mothers during their first year uh, comes across. In terms of family support and parenting support policy, uh, most of what's there is very clear that when we refer to parents, we're talking about everyone with a parenting role. So mothers, fathers, foster carers, kinship carers, uh, and many others. And, and, you know, we're quite clear that uh, they should be able to access parenting support when they need it. So there's quite a strong message already there in, in our policies and practices about the need to enable and support parents in their, in their parenting role. But, you know, there's a lot more work to do in how we, in how we measure this and how we, we deliver it in practice. Um, very often our statistics that we have and the research has focused on mothers rather than fathers. Like one example that came to mind was, we, we know what age women are giving birth, but we, we don't record the age of fathers, um, which, which I always find quite interesting. And it sends a message in itself. Um, in my own work area of work, we carried out a consultation earlier this year and uh, respondents had the option of saying if they were parents or somebody who works with parents. And uh, reading the report today, I was kind of struck in hindsight, we really missed an opportunity there with the consultation um, by not asking if somebody was responding as a mother or a father. So um, that's something I'll definitely be um, changing in the future. Um, this research published today for me really highlights the diversity of fathers and the many different circumstances and experiences um, that fathers have in Ireland. And, you know, it's very important to think about that as policymakers, because when we provide a universal entitlement, it doesn't benefit everybody, all fathers, and more importantly, their children equally. 
So, you know, we have to work hard to try and understand who will benefit and who may not benefit from um, additional entitlements. And, and it, there may not be an easy solution to these challenges, but we definitely need to think carefully about them. From the point of view of parenting support services, um, I think this research, you know, um, sends us in a number of directions. Uh, firstly, the services and supports that are aimed at all parents need to be genuinely inclusive of all parents um, in the language that they use, in the welcome uh, that parents receive, how the services are promoted and also how they're evaluated. So, you know, many parenting supports have traditionally been aimed at uh, mothers and, and evaluated using data from mothers. Um, so, so we need to change how that goes in the future. Um, Another example that comes to mind of particular support is breastfeeding support, and it's often presented as a women's issue, but there's a lot of evidence that fathers have considerable influence on mothers' decisions to initiate or continue with breastfeeding. So again, you know, we have to think about what information we're providing and who we're providing it to, um, and not just uh, either think about mothers on their own or, or, or lump all parents together in the one bundle. Um, and I think it's very important that for recognizing that existing services have not generally been uh, developed with fathers in mind. Um, it's really important that fathers are consulted and involved in the development of any new services um, and that we look carefully at how effective they are in meeting uh, fathers' parenting support needs. Um, one interesting example from the past uh, 18 months has been the shift it to online provision of many parenting um, talks and programs. And what a lot of the providers have said is that there's been large increases in fathers attending online talks and programs. Um, so I think it's important that we, 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 we keep that uh, accessibility there for fathers as much as possible. Uh, and build on it in the future. Um, one of the things that particularly struck me about the findings was um, the information it gives us about who experiences higher levels of parenting stress. And that's really helpful for, for deciding, you know, what services to prioritize and promote uh, and where there might be gaps um, where we will uh, improve outcomes for children by, by providing more services. Um, so sometimes the thing about research is you, you, it, it provokes thoughts on, on what additional research uh, would be, would also be useful to have. Um, I think there's a lot more work to be done about the impact of COVID on fathers and their parenting role. Um, new fathers in particular over the last 18 months who've had a really different introduction to fatherhood. Um, those who are working at home in close proximity uh, to their baby. Um, and also the impact of working from home for fathers of older children, um, I think will be really important to explore. Obviously, not all fathers or mothers can work remotely. And, you know, in particular, there's many parents who do shift work in, in many sectors, such as healthcare, retail, manufacturing, and other types of jobs. And the impact of shift working on the roles of both fathers and mothers and the lives of their children, I think would be um, really helpful to look at. Um, Ema mentioned something there about how we how we kind of target the information and communicate. And there's been some interesting behavioral economic studies in other countries where um, they've experimented with uh, communicating directly to fathers um, and, and, and being clear about that rather than just putting everything together under a parenting banner, uh, which, which I think uh, we should. Uh, explore more. Um, in the meantime, though, this report today gives us a huge uh, amount of helpful and valuable information about the lives of fathers and their children in Ireland, and we'll be examining it very closely uh, in the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth through a, through a number of different policy lenses. And, and I know it will be really information, helpful information to my colleagues working in other government departments as well. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Kira. That was um, that was really useful and I think gives us a really good overview, I suppose, of uh, some of the, the policy areas, I suppose, that you're thinking of um, uh, and the links, I suppose, with the with the research, which is really uh, useful. So, um, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending and for the really uh, constructive, I think, and engaging uh, set of questions and discussion that we've had.
Um, I'd like to thank the panelists, so my colleagues Ema and Helen, and Takira and Pigeon from uh, the department for joining us, and the minister uh, who joined us earlier on. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank the department uh, for supporting uh, this research um, and the wider research uh, partnership. Uh, so with that, um, I hope to see you at uh, future events and uh, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs>